Welcome everybody to the first talk of our seminar series. Today we are more than happy to have Mike Scott, our technical director at the Cryptography Research Center of TII. Mike is a cryptographer and software developer with many years of experience in the industry. He has also published uh, more than 100 academic papers and, and he's still one of the main developers of the MyRecord library, a very popular open source SDK for elliptic curve cryptography, which indeed is uh, one of his main areas of expertise. So as I said, uh, we are more than happy to have Mike as our first speaker. He's going to talk about different ways to keep secrets safe uh, from attackers, which indeed is a uh, not a, a, a trivial problem to solve. We have a Q&A chat uh, for attendees uh, where they can write uh, questions uh, for him. We will try to have a look at them at the end of your talk. Okay, Mike? Uh, okay. So we can, we can have uh, five to 10 minutes uh, for, for questions. So yeah, uh, Mike, uh, the stage is yours. Hey, thank you. Um, thank you, Santos, for that, uh, that, that kind introduction. Uh, just in case you're curious, I'm speaking to you from Ireland uh, in, a, in a place with the wonderful name of Bally James Duff, it's, uh, north of Dublin, quite close to the border with Northern Ireland. So it's a lovely sunny day, 10 degrees, really nice. Anyway, uh, thank, again, thank you all for attending. The topic I want to talk about today is one that's kind of critical to cryptography. Uh, indeed, it's often said about cryptography, cryptography is easy, uh, key management is hard, right? And in any cryptographic scheme that we come up with, often it all hinges on our ability to keep a, a secret key or, or keep some aspect of it secret. So keeping a secret is, is, is absolutely central to the, to the science of cryptography. So that's what I want to look at today. Uh, first of all, we need to make some effort to categorize secrets. The secrets come in different sizes and shapes uh, and of different significances. Uh, you know, there's lots of issues about the context in which they're generated, how they're used. Right? So there's lots of issues. All secrets are not created equal. Right? So some have a particular significance, some different significance. But anyway, this is an initial attempt just to categorize a secret based on the secret itself. So the first type of secret would be what I call a low entropy secret. Right? Typically, this has up to maybe 24 bits of unguessability about it. And to give you a concrete example of what I mean, I mean something like a pin number, right? A four digit or six digit pin number. And we're all familiar with that. So that's a kind of a, a low entropy secret. Now, of course, one issue with a low entropy secret is that it's vulnerable to what we call an offline dictionary attack, right? And I, I'm kind of making an effort here to fix some uh, terminology so that we're all on the same page. What's an offline dictionary attack? Well, basically, it's a lot of complicated way of saying something rather simple. Basically, it's an attack where the attacker can go through all the possible possibilities until they actually find the secret. And if the key has 24 bits of entropy, then we need to search through two to the power of 24 to find the right one, if we have some way of identifying the right one in that search process. So uh, a low entropy secret, is vulnerable to this kind of offline dictionary attack, right? Where we go through, a, if you like, a dictionary of all the possibilities for the key until we hit on the right one. And then we have the high entropy secret, where basically the key space is so big that it cannot possibly feasibly be searched through, right? If you imagine a, a, a computer program with a for loop, and that for loop iterates two to the power of 128 times, then that for loop will in effect never terminate, right? Well, it'll terminate by the time it's terminated, I'll be dead, you'll be dead, the, the, the planet will be dead, the sun will be dead, and the universe will only be dead as well, right? Because it's the key space is just too big, right? So high entropy secrets are not vulnerable to an offline dictionary attack. Uh, another type of secret that I'm gonna be referring to is an ephemeral secret. Uh, an ephemeral secret is one which only briefly exists. It, it comes into existence, it's used, and then it's destroyed, right? So it only has a fleeting existence. 
uh, and that kind of secret arises in cryptography as well. Then we have the, the more, uh, if I might call dangerous types of secrets, there's the long-term secret. There's one that has to be some value. And I'm talking about digital data here. So I'm talking about some, something that needs to be kept secret for uh, months, years, decades, maybe, right? A long-term secret, right? And of course, the longer a secret lives, the harder it is to protect, right? So that'd be the opposite of an ephemeral secret. And then what might be regarded as the, the most difficult case of all is when we have a database of secrets that we need to protect, right? So uh, that's a, a rough attempt at categorization. And one of the themes of this talk is that we would prefer our cryptographic scheme to be based on, on the, what I call the good secrets rather than the bad secrets. So we like cryptographic schemes that are based on things like low entropy secrets, right? Or ephemeral secrets because right? they're easier to protect, easier to remember, they're just easier to handle. Uh, the high entropy secret, it's more difficult. The long-term secret, well, it it's, takes more protection, a database of secrets. I would regard them as it being, if you like, bad secrets. So let's put it all in the, to a context and let's go back to the, uh, the early days of cryptography. Prior to 1970-ish, this was cryptography, right? Basically, it was the classic Alice and Bob situation, two individuals who wanted to carry out some kind of authenticated communication across a channel, which could be under the control or accessible to an attacker, right? And the, the oh, we'll modernize it a bit by using uh, things like the advanced encryption standard. So basically, in classic Alice and Bob, they both share a high entropy secret. Right. So something like 128-bit AES key. Now, of course, uh, back in the 1940s, they didn't have AES keys, they didn't have computers, but they had something very similar. During the Second World War, famously, the Germans had an Enigma machine, which, uh, which, was, uh, which was in some ways similar. And the, the key in that case was the position of the rotors. Uh, there were multiple rotors, so the number of combinations, number of possible keys was massive. And uh, to start a communication, the two Enigma machines involved in the communication would have the rotor set to the same initial start position. So that was the effective key back in those days, right? These days, uh, it's just 128-bit uh, AES key, right? And they'd use this key to encrypt their communication, right? Uh, now, the communication uh, was, if the cryptography was good, the, the communication would be safe because uh, an attack on the key wouldn't work because it would require an offline search for the key. Basically, they need to intercept part of this communication, try every possible key in order to decrypt it. But if the key space is big enough, that becomes an impossibility, right? Of course, in the case of the Enigma machine, they didn't implement it properly, right? But I think we can take it that uh, at this stage in the game, AES is secure in that regard, and there really is no better attack other than what we call a brute force search through the entire key space, which is impractical given the size of the key space. Of course, uh, quantum computer guys would know that in a quantum, post-quantum world, we'd need to double that to 256 bit. That doesn't really change the, the basic point. So what were the difficulties with that system? Why did it sometimes break down? Well, because this really was a bad secret that they were using. The secret, first of all, is too big to memorize. Right, 128 bits is not something we can carry around in our heads. Uh, well, some people probably could, but it'd be some feat of memorization to do it. To carry around in your head something with 128 bits of entropy. That's quite hard. Like that's, a, that's pages of text, if you like. So the, the secret basically is too big to memorize. And it lacks, the system, as I've described it, lacks something important, an important property that we rather confusingly call forward secrecy. What does forward secrecy mean? Well, it means that if our enemy had recorded our communication for months and then somehow they come across the key, then they could decrypt all those past communications. And the reason they could do that is because this system lacks forward secrecy, right? In cryptography, we can design systems which are forward secret and where uh, if the, uh, long-term keys involved in the scheme are discovered sometime in the future, it won't affect past uh, communication that was encrypted uh, earlier, 
right? Uh, another issue that was, uh, if you're using a, a, this in a long-term way, so this is a long-term key, the solution to the long-term key issue was key rotation. So basically, uh, if going back to the German Enigma uh, uh, setup, basically they use different uh, key settings, uh, maybe on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So they keep changing the key. So key rotation was, was, a, was a way of kind of trying to resolve these problems. Key rotation itself introduces difficulties because both ends need to remain in synchronism. If one of the parties rotates their keys and the other doesn't, then we're out of sync and we have a problem. So not a, not a great system, right? But how far have we come in the last 50 years? What's, in terms of modern cryptography, how can we improve on that? Well, we can actually do it much better, right? So this is a much better approach to Alice and Bob who is now available to us due to the advances in uh, crypto cryptography over the last 50 years. A uh, very important uh, protocol, one that perhaps doesn't get the press it should do, is uh, what's called a PIC, a password authenticated key exchange, right? And here, uh, we obtain the same functionality as we did before, but now in a much more convenient way. Basically, Alice and Bob now share a low entropy secret, right? Something like a PIN number. Right. Between them, they agree a strategy that which I want to call three strikes and you're out, right? which basically means that if either party uses the wrong pin number or if we're under attack from someone who's guessing pin numbers, after three attempts, the communication link will be dropped. Right. And they won't communicate because they'll assume that they're under attack. Right. So and as well as that, uh, there are two computers which they're going to be using these days are going to generate independent high entropy ephemeral keys, right? Those are those keys that just exist for a split second. Uh, then they're going to do a Diffie-Hellman key exchange and in a way that I'm not going to get into, somehow or other they integrate the pin into the exchange in order to thwart the, ma the man in the middle attack. Right, now, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but just briefly, classic Diffie-Hellman, if you, well, we all went to school and learned about cryptography. We thought Diffie-Hellman is a very clever algorithm, but it's completely wide open to a man in the middle of the attack because it's not authenticated. And, uh, and sometimes we came away from those lessons thinking that man in the middle was some omnipotent being that this uh, that couldn't be beaten. And uh, you no, know, the man in the middle was a very powerful entity. Turns out actually man in the middle is a very frag fragile individual. And it's actually not hard to thwart him and to block him. Right, so uh, and in this case, by using the, the mutual pin that they both share, something as simple as that, we can effectively lock out man in the middle. The system is fully forward secret. Why? Because it involves an ephemeral component. Right? That ephemeral secret is used in the calculation of the key, the session key that they actually use to communicate, and that is killed shortly after use. Right? So we achieve full forward secrecy. And the session key we use, because again of this uh, ephemeral secret that's independently generated by both sides on every communication because it's different every time the session key rotates naturally right so there's a much better solution right so just, let's just pause and think about that classic alice bob the old way of doing it modern ideas and cryptography they take us to a much better way of doing it right and i said the reason it's better i maintain is because we're using a better class of secret Right? We're using things like low entropy or ephemeral secrets, which are better secrets. Because any practical cryptographic protocol, when we try and make it practical and use it in the real world, my case would be that it's the type of secrets involved in it that will determine whether the product gets taken up in the real world or not. Right? If you come up with a protocol that involves lots of the wrong types of secrets, it won't work so well, it'll keep getting attacked, it'll keep getting hacked, and it won't be used so much. You use the right types of secrets, you're much better in that regard. Your product probably will succeed. It probably will be used. And I'm going to make that point now in a minute. All right, so let's just recall. We've gone from a scheme that required a long-term high entropy secret to one with the same functionality, which requires a low entropy secret and an ephemeral secret. Let's take the idea a little bit further. If we use the simple ratcheting idea for Diffie-Hellman, we don't even require the pin. Number. In fact, we only really require the pin initially for the first initial contact between Alice and Bob. And in that way, they can gain some kind of initial authentication. 
right? And the idea with, with ratchety is that we bootstrap the next communication from the secret agreed in the previous communication, right? So it's a ratchet where we're uh, from the, we use what was the output of the last communication as an input to generating the secret for our next communication. And we carry on forward like that indefinitely. And two very good examples of the use of a Diffie-Hellman ratchet are Signal and Telegram, right? And I think we'll all agree they're examples of a very successful deployment of cryptography, right? The, the, these are applications which, which governments don't like. Uh, they're effectively unbreakable. It's a good example how cryptography can produce rock solid products that really work out in the real world. And the, the reason I would maintain is because they use the right types of secret. Uh, interestingly, you may be aware that in TII, some of us are working on a TLS 1.3 implementation. I'd never really looked at TLS before in any detail. So I was rather surprised when I looked at 1.3 to realize I thought TLS was based on RSA public key encryption. It's not anymore. It's actually based on Diffie-Hellman. The, the mutual secret between client and server is actually derived using a, a Diffie-Hellman algorithm, right? And at the end of the, your TLS connection, the, the client is given a ticket, right? And that ticket is basically allows them to ratchet on their next connection to the same website. They don't have to go through the whole PKI palaver again. They can reconnect with the server, ratcheting forward from the, the, the last connection. So the, the Diffie-Hellman ratchet is, is taken over the world, really, uh, and it, it, it's pro proven to be enormously successful. Okay, let's move on to uh, another topic. Where do we keep the secret? Well, if it's a low entropy secret, we can keep it in our heads, right? Uh, and if we keep, our head is actually a good place to keep a secret, right? Because it's not vulnerable to remote attack, because reading minds at a distance is still not a possibility, thank goodness. It probably might not ever become possibility. Uh, I remember when I used to teach cryptography and I used to teach classic uh, Alice and Bob, uh, I used to, to say, you know, you have this enormous key space to search through to find a key. It was effectively impossible. But then I'd say, there's this other method of cryptanalysis, which can break Alice and Bob almost immediately. And then I'd pause and the students would all lean forward and pay attention and think, what am I talking about? And then I'd slowly describe in detail how I, if I was the attacker, I go down to my local hardware shop, I cut a length of rubber hose about that long, and then I'd head round to Alice's house, and I'd break in the door, I'd tie Alice to a chair, and I'd start beating her around the head with the rubber hose until she told me what the key was, right? This is known as, in, in the trade, as uh, rubber hose cryptography, right? Not mathematical at all, I'm afraid. So uh, secrets kept in your head aren't necessarily that safe because they're vulnerable to coercion, and it may be, coercion on your person, or it may be through a tiger kidnapping. They may kidnap someone near and dear to you and threaten to do harm to them. Or indeed, it can be got out of your head using simple social engineering. Uh, someone uh, once did a test where they went out in the street, stopped people at random and asked them for their pin number. I think something like one in five person just told them, you know, they told them the pin number. So uh, amazingly. Uh, and of course, there's the more sophisticated phishing attacks where the, the pin number is extracted from the person and given away inadvertently, right? So ephemeral secrets, of course, don't have to be kept anywhere. They come, they live, they die, they're gone. High entropy, long-term secrets, that's more problematic. Okay, now let's look at another case which is close to my heart. User, uh, sorry, client server authentication. And here, of course, what we currently use is username password, and we use it to gain access to a service. Now, username and password is of the same vintage of classic Alice and Bob. We're going back to the 1970s here. But of course, whereas we don't use classic Alice and Bob anymore, funnily enough, we're still using username and password, right? And that's interesting because username and password is horrible. It's a mess and it's completely broken. So this would be an, a nice use case to try and advance as we did with classic Alice and Bob, to, you know, to advance to a much better way of doing it. Now, Let's just set the scene. A password is not used as an encryption key. Uh, it's used to authenticate the client to the server. Server to client authentication will assume is taken care of by SSL TLS, right? Uh, the password in theory could be low entropy because the server is, can implement three strikes and you're out, right? So if you try and enter this, the wrong password three times in a row, the server will lock you out. So uh, that should work. Uh, basically it's a shared secret scheme. Right? Basically, and the way it works is, as you're probably all 
familiar. Something derived from the user password is stored next to their username and it's something called a password file. And this password file has an entry for every user of the server service. Uh, and the client credential, which is a word I'm going to be using more frequently, the password is simply handed over to the server for checking. Now, we basically pass our, hand our password over, the server does some manipulation on it and compares it and the value stored in the database and then decides to let you in. Uh, I think I can safely say username password is a, a failure of cryptography, a failure by cryptographers, really. We should be ashamed of ourselves if this is the best we've come up with in 2021. So anyway, what is actually stored? Well, we actually store a hashed password, right? And you might ask yourself, why? Well, obviously, well, maybe not so obvious. I think it's probably because uh, we might be worried that some system operator on the server side might just look at the password file and look at everyone's passwords. And there, there they all are. And that's probably not a good idea. So it's kind of a lightweight attempt to encrypt it. Right? And basically it's a field attempt to encrypt the password file, right? Because obviously we're worried that people at the server side may, may be looking at it and, and, and may be trying to extract information from it. I say it's failed because uh, it, this doesn't really save us, uh, especially if we're using a low entropy secret, right? It can still be decrypted easily. So it's a very lightweight and basically failed attempt to encrypt the password file. That password file is the worst of bad secrets. It's a database of long-term secrets. Those passwords are there for a long time. Here we have a database full of them. It's the worst type of secret, the hardest to look after. Uh, and we can't use low entropy passwords because as you know now, you are not allowed to. The system operator, if we try and use a, a, a low entropy password and say, ah, ah, no, capital letters, lowercase letters, strange alphanumerics, whatever, 16 digits long. Right, we're not, so what's going on here? Well, why are we, the clients being punished and forced to use unmemorizable passwords? Well, it's because a low entropy secret can be found by an offline dictionary attack by anyone with access to the password file. But surely no unauthorized people should be accessing the password file. The password file should be protected by the server. That's the server's job to look after stuff like that. So what's gone wrong here? So. Basically, we're, uh, we end up with the client being forced to generate a, a, basically a high entropy secret, you know, not a low entropy password, not, not necessarily nothing like a pin number. And we're back to the classic Alice and Bob situation. Basically, both sides are sharing a high entropy secret, basically. Uh, so, and the blame is not being pinned on the server. Outrageously, we're being blamed for using weak passwords. It's their fault, the server's end's fault. They didn't protect the password file. And they're trying to fix their problem by getting us to come up with unmemorizable, hard to use passwords. Right? You know, you get really angry about that. Why, why are we being punished? Well, here's a point I want to make. It, the reason why we think about it is because servers cannot guarantee the integrity of the password file. And I want to now repeat that in various ways because it's incredibly significant. Servers have proven incapable of keeping it a secret. Internet facing servers are incapable of keeping disk files secure from hackers. And I know I'm repeating myself, but I'm just for emphasis really. Uh, ser a server is incapable of protecting an online credential database, which contains data related to client secrets, right? And it's just a fact of life. I think we just have to get over it. And it's the reason that cybersecurity is much easier for attackers than it is for defenders, because we have this huge issue Servers can't look after stuff in disk files, right? I know we're supposed to have firewalls and so on, all kinds of protections there, but hackers get through and they're still getting through. In 2021, they're still getting through. So it's something we're going to have to work around rather than try and hope that somehow it will get fixed. It's not getting fixed and we're having to use bigger and more awkward to remember passwords all the time. Another problem, of course, is usually a password is wide open to a phishing attack because we basically hand over our credential to have it uh, checked. Uh, and of course, as cryptographers, we know there is potentially a much better way. Something called, we call zero knowledge, which again is a high flute and rather intimidating term, but really it's quite a simple idea. Basically the idea is we prove possession of the credential without actually handing it over. We prove we have it, but we don't just simply give it to the other individual because that other individual may be a bad individual. 
right? So we just use it in the way that only we could use it if the credential were genuine, right? So that's the basic idea behind zero knowledge. And of course, username password is single factor. Passwords can be shoulder surfed and it's a help desk nightmare. Passwords are constantly being forgotten and people have to have them reset. They're being reset by they send you an email to your email account, which is protected by a password. <laughs> so uh, it's all pretty horrible. So really this needs fixing. So can we fix it like we fixed classic Alice and Bob? But, but first of all, let's see what can servers do? Well, apparently I would deduce that they can keep individual secrets safe in a running program, in memory, in other words, not on a file, but in memory. And the reason I deduce this is because servers execute SSL protocol all the time. And the SSL protocol requires them to digitally sign something using a secret key, right? Uh, and if hackers could snatch this secret key out of the server's running memory, they'd be doing it. It'd be happening all the time and SSL would be broken. But SSL isn't broken, it works. So obviously this is hard to do. Now, I'm not a hacker. I don't know what hackers can and can't do, but it certainly appeared to me that they haven't proven really able to do this kind of thing. Uh, so it doesn't seem to be happening, right? As long as the server is bug free, there was the famous heart bleed attack on this, but that was because the, the open SSL code was, was buggy. And basically by the, the client uh, did something from his side to provoke a, a memory overflow attack, the server actually basically handed over the secret to the client, which is pretty stupid, right? So that, that, was, that was a problem, that was a bug, right? That's been patched long since, right? So servers can keep individual secrets, right? So we can trust servers to maintain individual secrets, not just not databases full of them, right? So some kinds of secrets, they can protect good secrets, bad secrets, they can't. Now, here's an idea, secure hardware, right? And we often think of secure hardware as answering all and it could, right? Uh, but you'll recall that we managed to fix Alice and Bob without using it, right? The password authenticated key exchange doesn't need secure hardware, right? So it's perhaps not essential, uh, but the idea is a good one. The secrets and the algorithms that use them are stored and executed within a secure enclave, right? And secure, what's a secure enclave? Well, all smart mobile phones have such a thing. It's a secure area in the, in, in the processor's memory space. And indeed, Amazon uh, Web Services will rent you out at what's called a hardware security module in the cloud to keep your secrets in, right? So uh, secure hardware is out there. And secure hardware can act as, I regard it as something of a crutch. It's often used as a crutch in cryptographic protocols because it can act as a trust anchor, somewhere where you can finally anchor your trust of your complex cryptographic protocol on the, in the assumption that whatever it's protecting cannot be attacked. It's a safe place, in other words keep a secret, right? And there's something that I might do, some trivial thing here, I might call the secure hardware transformation. How do we transform the need for a high entropy secret into a need for a low entropy secret? Well, you write down your high entropy secret on a piece of paper, you stick it in the safe with a four digit pin lock combina combination. The safe is operating three strikes and you're out. And uh, basically we've transformed a high entropy secret, although the need to memorize a, or keep safe a high entropy secret the need to keep secret, a low entropy secret. We've gone from a bad secret to a good secret. Right? And secure hardware can do that for us. However, there are downsides. Now, if you're thinking about secure hardware, a very good analogy is those hotel room safes that we're all familiar with. You book into the hotel, somewhere in the cupboard there's a safe. Uh, uh, basically, you enter a PIN number, a four digit PIN, and that pops open the safe. You put your valuables in there and close it. It won't open again until you enter the same pin number again. And it's implementing three strikes and you're out. So a low entropy pin is fine, right? Of course, uh, what, what can happen? What can go wrong? It sounds great. Secure hardware doing a good job. You forget your pin, right? Do you lose your passport forever? Is your cash gone forever? No, you go down to hotel reception and they send up a guy in dirty blue overalls who fiddles with the safe and pops it open for you. Right, so well, how did they do that? Well, because your secure hardware has a back door, right? It's there for a reason. And you, you're grateful for it being there in this case, because you get your passport back. So well, what's the story on back doors and hardware? Well, I want to call it Scott's law, or, or I'm sure other people have come up with it. And it's probably not true in all cases, but 
there's always exceptions, isn't there? But I'm going to maintain that all secure hardware has a manufacturer's back door. I remember once I went to a, a, to a meeting with uh, in GCHQ in London. Uh, this is the British Secret Service, basically. But this was the non-secret end of things. This is the civilian end of it. We were just having a friendly chat. We were asking them what they could do for us with a soft, with a product we had, a cryptographic product. And at the end of the meeting, we we're having a friendly talk, and they they, they were asking me, uh, uh, you know, they were asking us what you know, uh, what, what can we do for them? And they were saying a big problem they had, a huge concern was all our mobile phones. They're all made from components made in China, and they had a very big concern that the Chinese were putting back doors into that hardware so they could eavesdrop on our mobile phones. And I remember. My naive response, probably naive response, was to say, no, they wouldn't do that. I mean, they're just making money. I mean, they're very good at what they do. They wouldn't be putting back doors in there. And the, I, remember, I still remember this day, the guy leaned across the table and said, I know they're putting back doors into their hardware because if we had their capability, we'd be doing it, right? Which is a very compelling argument. <laughs> so uh, it's my belief that back doors do exist. And uh, so do you care? I mean, maybe you're grateful for it, you know, maybe you think it's a good idea, it depends. Uh, but back doors can fall into the wrong hands. You may regard the government as being the right hands or the, the, the chip manufacturer as being trustworthy, but they can fall into the wrong hands. Remember the guy in the dirty blue overalls? Well, he's got a cousin in the mafia. Right, now, he didn't know that. Right, so there's a, something to worry about. Other problems with hardware, it's expensive. It can't be updated or patched like buggy so, uh, like software, we can always patch and update software. It represents an unmoving target for hackers. It becomes a crutch to lean on. It's expensive, uh, there are issues with it. And of course, it represents what we sometimes call in the game, a single point of failure. It's always tempting to put all of your trust in one supposedly rock solid entity that solves all your problems. But it's always a bad idea because it's always what hackers go straight for. They'll identify the single point of failure and they'll ruthlessly go after it. Right. And of course, they also want maximum bang for the buck for their effort. So going back to the username password scenario, I mean, why go after an individual's password when you can grab the entire password file and get everyone's password? Right. So um, hackers will be you know, making the best use of their time. Another potential single point of failure are the, the security hucksters who say, trust me and my low friction security products and all your security concerns will, will be fine. Everything will be great. And of course, that huckster is your single point of failure. Uh, he may well, probably will at some stage, let you down and you let him in. Right? So this is something to be wary of. Uh, here's a recent uh, story that you're probably all aware of, solar winds. Not my fault, I'll come back to that in a second. Basically, this was an amazing attack where hackers gained complete undetected control over the authentication server. On the face of it, it looked like a secure system. The clients were using two-factor authentication. It's something I'll come back to. Generally regarded as a good idea. Something from a company called Duo. But Duo was regarded as not to blame because the attack wasn't on the client side. It was on the server side. And basically, the attackers could read write the credential database, which means they could log into anyone's account undetected. So they could gain complete control over this credential data. And problem was that the authentication server was a catastrophic single point of failure. I say not my fault because I remember shortly after it happened, I got a letter from SolarWinds and they, they were doing a security audit and it turns out they were using some software I wrote. Oops, right, bad moment. But it turns out that no, that's not how the hackers got in. But anyway, yeah, interesting. I'm, I'm still in uh, communication with them over that. So let's come back to username password and let's try and fix it. Well. Two-factor authentication, definitely a, a good idea, right? Uh, and it's often recommended uh, uh, for, for client security. And commonly, conveniently, we can use the mobile phone as, as basically a second factor, and it's secure on clear. Uh, there's something called FIDO, which was established in 2013. It's backed by Apple, Google, all the main players are involved in it because everyone's aware the username and password has to go. And these guys are were tasked with coming up with a the ultimate solution to it. And, uh, it's generally regarded uh, as a good thing and as a likely successor to username and password. It's, however, it's been slow to achieve widespread adoption outside of enterprise. I think it's fair to say that. How does it work? Right now, this is interesting. 
as a replacement for username and password. Basically, the client generates a, a, a private public key pair, right? using public key for Toad. On registration, the public key is stored in a server-side credential database. Right? And that's that credential database again. right? But then now it consists of uh, client public keys. The, the client private key, uh, which the, the client themselves generated, is stored inside their secure enclave. To authenticate, the server generates a random challenge. The client enters a PIN or a biometric on a three strikes and you're out basis to allow access to the secure enclave. Then the private key inside the secure enclave sizes the challenge and returns it to the server. The server verifies the signature using the public key extracted from the credential database. Now, on many levels, this is a big improvement. First of all, we don't actually use our, we don't hand over our credential. We, our, our credential is a, a public key, sorry, it's a, it's a digital signing key, right? And we just use it to sign the challenge. We don't hand over our signing key. We just hand over the signed challenge, right? So we're revealing nothing. So it's effectively zero knowledge. We're revealing nothing about our secret, right? So phishing attacks are not possible against FIDO, right? And, and that's a huge improvement. Uh, so it's effectively zero knowledge. The private key never leaves the enclave we hand, haven't handed over our credential as in many alternative schemes. We just used it to sign something, right? So uh, just to, uh, let, 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 let's look at that again. First of all, there's a great client side user experience, uh, but pretty good. Uh, and it's genuinely two factor authentication because knowing the pin without access to the phone, no, you can't authenticate. Accessing the phone, but no access to the pin or not unable to provide the correct biometric, you cannot authenticate. So it's two-factor authentication. You need a PIN number uh, and you need the phone, right? Otherwise, you can't do it. Now, this is just one flavor of FIDO, but there are other flavors of FIDO that I'm not going to go into. So the user's experience is two-factor authentication and a warm, fuzzy feeling concerning the security of their, their account, right? So you feel good if you're using it. You feel that this is better than using your password. I don't have to remember a big, long password. I just have to remember a password or stick my face in my phone, right? So nice and easy, good. Okay, now let's take, let's strip it down. Let's take it apart. First of all, it's not two-factor. Surprisingly, it's actually not two-factor because an attacker who can break into the secure vault can grab the private key and doesn't need the pin, right? So anyone, you know, the guy in the blue overalls, that guy, he could just reach into your secure enclave and grab your private key and then they can uh, authenticate as if they were you. They can use it directly. They don't need the pin. Remember, the pin was to gain access to the enclave. Well, we bypassed it. And of course, while they're in there, they can steal the biometric template, which is bad news for your privacy. And of course, the, the big problem is the credential database hasn't gone away. It's still there on the server side, right? And you might say, ah, but it just contains public keys. So maybe, you know, public keys are public keys. They don't need protecting, do they? Well, careful now. Uh, Public key cryptography has a well-known problem. Uh, how can you be sure who actually owns the public key? And to, to resolve that problem, that's why we have the PKI, the public key infrastructure, right? So then we're into the world of X509 certificates and certificate authorities. And that in, in effect resolves the problem of, of public key ownership, right? But uh, public key infrastructure is actually, has never been successfully deployed on the client side, right? Otherwise we'd all be using it to secure our emails. And, Probably not. So uh, uh, FIDO didn't want to impose this on, on the uh, this PKI issue on the unfortunate client because they're trying to make life easier for the client. So FIDO doesn't use a PKI, right? Therefore, an attacker who hacks the credential database can substitute client public keys with their own public keys and hence gain access to client accounts. Right? And it's interesting when you read the FIDO documentation and you think, hang on, what's going on here? I thought this was an improvement on username and password. There's still a credential database. It's still a major vulnerability. Servers are still unable to protect such a thing. So what do FIDO do? Well, if you read the spec, it's quite amusing because I had to dig into pages of this before I actually got to this blunt statement where they say such an attack, yes, such an attack is realistic, but they say it's outside of the scope of the FIDO specification. So they just wash their hands of it and say, nothing to do with us, you know? So that's the problem with FIDO. Great for the client, but they've done nothing to, 
to solve the problem on the server side. That credential database is still there, it's still a vulnerability, and they're not really uh, making appropriate efforts to protect it, right? So the main attack vector on username and password, the hacking of the credential database has not been fixed by FIDO. The authentication server is still a single point of failure. A solar winds like attack could succeed. So let's quickly see, can we fix it, right? Because that's what we should have done. We should have done it years ago, but uh, let's see, can we properly fix it, right? First of all, we're going to separate registration from authentication, right? Because really, you register only once, you authenticate every day. So there's no need for the same entity to register you and to authenticate you. Let's divide out that functionality because they're naturally really quite separate. So to do this, we're going to introduce a trusted distributed authority, which checks credentials and issues uh, secrets to clients. Uh, each individual trusted authority issues just part of the secret, right? So there's no single point of failure. Right? And that's important that this system I'm, I'm going to propose is designed to avoid any single point of failure. So we have more than one trusted authority. We have two or three of them. Uh, and the, the trusted authority, the distributed trusted authority also issues a single secret to the server. Servers are good at looking after single secrets, not databases of secrets. These distributed DTAs are largely offline. They're only required for registration. They're not required to be online for authentication purposes. They're, they're gone at that stage, they've done their job. Uh, each client constructs their secret, their, their, their credential, right, from its parts. Uh, they add together the bits they got from each individual trusted authority. And then from that hole, they subtract a four digit pin of their own choosing. So they literally, they just break it into two. The remaining part of their secret, a, a big blob of data is stored somewhere. Maybe in their browser, maybe in a cookie, maybe in secure hardware if you have it. Uh, but uh, basically, the big blob of data is, is protected by being useless without the pin, right? So by splitting the secret in two, we've effectively offered some level of protection to the secret, to, to the parts of the secret, because individually, they're not of any use. So there's no client-side hardware required, right? That blob of data and the pin are the two factors required for authentication. When authentication is required, they're simply added back together again. Right? So ephemerally, they're put back together and we, we go into the authentication protocol. There's no credential database. Right? By having registration done separately, we don't have a credential database, not an online credential database. It's gone, nothing there to hack, right? which is really the only way of solving that problem because servers cannot protect something like a credential database. That's our initial premise. And it's, I, Still hold it's still true. And uh, one of the ways this works is, is that the credential we use is largely self-verifying. Uh, a self-verifying credential, like that sounds interesting. Well, well that's, uh, we're actually quite familiar with it. Our passports are largely self-verifying. When we hand them over a passport control, there's enough information in the password to authenticate it to the person who's examining it. They don't have to go to any database to check it. They, they probably do. There's probably some local database of criminals and, some UN generated list of international terrorists and all the rest of it, right? But they don't have to check that back at the, not your, with your home country to ensure that you were issued with a password. They don't have to do that, right? It's largely self-verified. Uh, and also, again, we're going, we want to avoid phishing attacks because we need to design in some kind of zero knowledge challenge response idea between client and server to prevent phishing attacks. But if we use cryptography, that's actually quite easy to do. And of course, server is implementing three strikes and you're out. So we can get away with a simple, using a simple pin, a low entropy pin, right? That prevents pin guessing attacks, right? Is this possible? Well, with standard uh, public key cryptography, I couldn't think any way of doing it, right? It needed something called pairing based cryptography. And that's a big thing that's been happening recently since uh, the millennium is new methods of cryptography have become available to us with new structures, new capabilities, new possibilities. Pairing based cryptography has opened up a number of doors which were slammed close to us until its discovery, like identity based encryption would be the, the classic example. And, and, and lattice based, if you're into post quantum, lattice based cryptography also uh, enables all kinds of, enables us to do all kinds of new things that we couldn't do back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and indeed, by using pairing based cryptography, we came up with a solution to uh, authentication, right? So uh, what have we done? Well, we can dispense with secure hardware on the client side, right? So don't like secure hardware, we can dispense with, although if we have it, we can use it, but that blob of data, 
would be a handy place to put it, but, but we're not leaning on it as a crutch. We don't absolutely need it. Just as we improve classic Alice and Bob without having to reach to, uh, to secure hardware. See, secure hardware is like a, it's like a drug, you know, you reach for it. It's a crutch, you know, that you want to lean on, but let, let's try and not to if we can. So, because there are issues that arise with it. And basically we end up achieving a robust two-factor authentication. I'm not going to go into the details of how this invention works. It's uh, something that is described on this website. Uh, now, the question is, and going back to the beginning, where are the secrets, right? Well, with username and password, now looking at it from this perspective, the old username and password is so bad because it required a single high entropy secret on the client side, and the server had to maintain a database of secrets, right? So we end up with bad secrets on both sides. That's the way username and password has, involved, has evolved. Used clients are faced with having to memorize high entropy, difficult to remember passwords. The server has to remember a database of secrets. Those are both bad secrets, right? So it's a system designed around bad secrets. So what I've attempted to do is design a system that's designed around good secrets. And let's see to what extent we've succeeded, right? So the system I'm proposing the client has got a low entropy secret to remember, we keep it in their head, a blob of data stored somewhere, but not, not critical because without the pin it's useless because we're using two-factor authentication, but maybe we keep it in secure hardware if you have it, sure, why not? Uh, the server has to maintain a single high entropy secret, which it can maintain in memory, right? And we reckon because of SSL that they, yes, they can do that. The trusted authority is distributed. So by dividing things up, each individual secret isn't as critical anymore. And each member just needs to keep a single high entropy uh, secret, right? You don't actually have to keep a credential database. Once you've issued a credential, it's a, the, the initial database is destroyed. It doesn't necessarily matter. Think back to the passport case. The passport is still valuable, even if they, the country that issued it goes offline for a month. The passport still works, right? So the, the, the attempt, and to the extent to which we've been successful, I let others judge. But the idea, I think, is a good one to move from a system that's based around bad secrets to a system that's based around good secrets, right? And the compromise of any single secret does not lead to a break, right? There's no single point of failure. A solar winds attack on this system wouldn't work actually, uh, because it, they they need to do more than just hack the authentication server. I'm not going to go into too much details of that, but I want to end up with some good news because what's the real solution, right? As well as going from bad secrets to good secrets, like a very powerful idea to improve our secrecy protection is to share a secret, divide it up. It's an old idea going back to Shamir secret sharing, but it's a it's an underused idea, but it's a very strong idea, and it basically it exists, of course, in two-factor authentication. And two-factor authentication works in practice because an attacker, it's, it's difficult for an attacker. An attacker think, feels great if they solve one problem and they, they manage to grab one secret. Ask them to solve a completely different problem, which requires a completely different set of skills, to, to grab another secret. And they have to get both of them before they've managed to break the system. That's very demoralizing for an attacker. And hackers generally uh, fade away at that stage and kind of throw their hat at it. Right? But the idea of... of, of Two-factor authentication needs to be applied to all aspects of the system, not just the client side like FIDO. We need to look back at the server side. And of course the server is where the hackers going over. There's the main bang for the buck. We need to look at what's going on in the server and we need to do our best to try and sort things out at that end. There's no point just making it look good for, for the client, you know, a nice flashy FIDO-based system. Oh, I'm two-factor authentication, aren't I great? You know, I'm secure. Where, you know, things are on pear-shaped, uh, on, on the server side. And a big big part of this is, is multi-party communication, right? Uh, we'll look at this website in a minute. So another big point is there must be no single point of failure. Secure hardware should be used as a backup, not as a crutch. Right, now let's visit this uh, website because I just want to make one final point. Uh, let me uh, share my screen again. Okay. Right, I have nothing to do with this company, I would say. I've known, uh, a guy called Nigel Smart is a big part of it, and I have great respect for Nigel as a cryptographer. But just to make the point that this isn't just me saying this stuff, other people are saying this stuff. I regard these people as very forward-looking in the world of cryptography. They're big into multi-party uh, 
computation, which I think is got a huge part to play in, in, in the future. But look at what they're saying. No hardware dependency, right? Yeah, wasn't, didn't I just say that? Uh, being dependent on hardware, generally not a good idea. Uh, credential database, you can't steal what isn't there. Not just me saying it, they're saying the same thing. That some things that can't be protected, you just need to do away with them. You need to come up with a better protocol that effectively does away with them. Uh, split, split the keys. That, that, that's my final uh, takeaway on all of that. Uh, so uh, at this stage, I think I am finished. Sorry, I'm trying to, uh, oh, wait a minute, what am I doing? Sorry, just bear with me again. I'll just bring my presentation back up again in case there's any questions on it. Right, so uh, that's basically uh, my, my presentation and my conclusion, right? Move from bad secrets to good secrets. Uh, don't rely on secure hardware. Certainly use it as, a, as an adjunct, but don't, don't depend on it. Uh, share secrets, split them up. Uh, design a system properly. It's, if you can't protect the secrets, then your protocol won't make it out into the real world because it'll get hacked, attacked, and, and broken into bits, right? So you need to give a lot of thought to how you protect your mission critical secrets. And there are tools out there to do it. There are methods to do it. It may require you to move all your comfort zone uh, into new types of cryptography, but I'm afraid in, in some cases, uh, that's what we're gonna have to do. Okay, so the end. Thank you very much for your involvement. Okay. Uh... Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mike. It was a very nice talk. Uh, I I can see we have uh, some questions in the Q and A chat. I, do you have access to to it? Yeah, I, I'm just reading it now. Perhaps I'll just read out the the questions. This one's from Ricardo. Just as yes. we have Isaac Asimov's robotics law, we could have something similar with passwords. I propose as a first law, we all have the right to choose the password we want without any restrictions. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We should have regain control over things we need to memorize. We should control them. And uh, it shouldn't be imposed on us. To, this, I mean, we all know it. I mean, we're, we're all fed up to the teeth. I mean, I, I have some, I mean, we all, and we all start behaving badly. We all start using the same password for everything. I mean, hands up. I do it or, or we just fiddle with the same password by changing the letter A to an at sign or something something like that. You know, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's really very bad, really bad situation. Uh, another one from Ricardo. Keys memorized by human beings we know as passwords. We humans have to adapt to the security requirements imposed by the systems to establish a password. It happens that we are different and over time we lose the ability to memorize such passwords considered good or appropriate. What do you think of proposing a world without passwords? Wouldn't it be a much better world for people? Yeah, and indeed, uh, th there's a big move to just move away from them altogether, even the, to move away from pin numbers and to substitute them with biometrics. But I think, I actually like pin numbers. I think there's a lot to be said for them. Biometrics, I would worry about. They remove passwords, but the way I think of it, uh, a biometric isn't a password, it's a username because our biometrics were continually pushing them into the public domain all the time. I mean, there's my face, it's in your face. As a biometric, I've kind of given it away at this stage, right? As I do with my fingerprints and all my other biometrics. Uh, so uh, that's something to worry about. And, and biometric overuse, our biometrics leak out, our biometric templates leak out. I think there could be privacy concerns arising for that and a lot of concerns. So uh, a pin is just something, in your head. I don't think it's too onerous to ask people to remember a pin. And, uh, and with the three strikes and your out thing applying, of course. Uh, so uh, yeah, it'd be great if, we, if someone come up with a way of doing without passwords, but maybe not you. There are other authenticators as well, like you know, it's the, your, your GPS, your position, you're supposed to be in a particular place. There's a PhD student of mine, Neil Costigan, set up a company called Behaviour Sec, which is making, is doing very well with the banks. And they, they authenticate you through your typing patterns on the keyboard and your general behavior. And they, that's a, a completely non-cryptographic approach to the problem. 
And by combining these things, and I think a lot of people are doing, maybe we can drop the password component altogether. Uh, another question, is someone breaking into, a, sorry, from anonymous, is someone breaking into a secure enclave really a probable scenario? Having smart cards like credit and SIM cards been secure for decades, or have there been major breaches I'm unaware of? Uh, I, I remember once I went to visit the Gem Plus in Southern France, and, I, and they were the guys making the smart chips. And I had a long talk with David McCash about it. And what he described to me was an ongoing battle between themselves and the hackers, right? Where they were just about staying one step ahead. And yeah, I mean, uh, I would maintain that uh, there, I mean, there, there, I haven't got any stories that come immediately to mind, but uh, I, I'd certainly be aware Breaking into it may be difficult, but the person with the back door, of course, doesn't need to break into it. And that back door key can get lost or get given away or get passed on or get coerced. So, yeah, yeah, something to think about there. Uh, another question, Lucas, is this proposal still appropriate for databases that also store session information since by the threat model, the attackers can just fraudulent, fraudulent sessions directly? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what point you're making there. I mean, you, you, you can hijack sessions, I'm aware of attacks like that. Uh, so, I, no, I'm, I'm not sure if I have a good answer for that. Uh, blockchain, of course, blockchain is always going to get a mention, and, and maybe it has a role to play as, as a way of, of, of sharing uh, secret information. Yeah, so I can see a, an application there. Uh, uh, do I think the banking industry should move away from HSMs towards multi-party com computation? I, yeah, I, I would be for that. I think that's that's the way to go. Anyway, the banks don't like using hardware. I mean, on their end, sorry, the server end, they're quite happy to use hardware. But uh, I know that a lot of the banks issue to their customers like me a little piece of hardware that I stick my ATM card in to authenticate. And the banks hate that because it's expensive. It's a fair client expense. And of course, clients, the thing about client and hardware is clients lose them. Why do you end up with a drawer full of half forgotten hardware tokens and you don't know which one's used for what purpose anymore? And they're all from different manufacturers and they don't interact with one another. And that can become a bit of a nightmare as well. Uh, what about password managers? Yeah, I think they're a good idea. Yeah, I don't use one myself. I, but uh, especially a cloud-based password manager, oh, is there a backdoor there? And if so, you've kind of lost everything. Uh, so it's all a question of trust and who you trust with. Another question, can we replace the three, te, three trials and you're out? Uh, yeah, by something like proof of work. Uh, yeah, I guess, hadn't thought of it, but there's some original thinking going on out there, which I'm glad to see. Uh, seems like a password, uh, Wang, it seems like a password management system like KeePass is not also a good idea. Seems it, it also handle a large pass file. Is there any way to handle this? Well, again, it's uh, we've, we've just moved our secret keeping from one context to another. There's still some secret that needs to be kept. I know when this house, I, mean, I have an apartment in Dublin as well. And when we move out, what we do is, it's my wife's idea actually, we lock all the doors, we take all the keys out of all the locks, we put all the keys in the shoe, we lock the shoe in the cupboard, we take the key out of the cupboard door and we hide the key in, in the cooker, in the grill section, right? So we've still got a secret to protect, but we've we kind of obfuscated it so far down the line. We have kind of layered security. And it, I, I pity the poor uh, drug addled burglar that breaks into our house and tries to figure out where the key is because they're not going to find it. But so it, maybe it can work in, in, in some senses. But uh, yeah, but I mean, it, it's not a particularly sophisticated uh, response. Uh, another question I see here, uh, the use of uh, KDFs with low entropy secrets introducing degree of slowness. Yeah, that, of course, that, that's a good idea. An iterated, memory hungry. Uh, there's a lot of research going into this, uh, you know, uh, compute hungry, memory hungry, uh, hashy, basically, which just consumes resources. Uh, yeah, I think you have to be worried about that because you maybe you shouldn't underestimate the resources, the compute resources available to a determined attacker. But yeah, it could be part of the problem, part of the solution rather. Yeah. So, Mark, you want to say something? Um, no, 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 all clear. Okay. I think we don't have any more questions, right, Santos? Okay, I no. think we.
I think I've gone over the hour. Apologize for that. If I'm keeping you from your weekend. Ah, uh, yes, there is one one more. Sorry, Mike. Okay. Right. If big companies, this is from Hamid. If, if if big companies like Google decided to use pairing or multi-party computation instead of passwords or authentication, that then might be more secure. But what challenges they could face, and what stops them from taking this approach? Yeah, I, I don't. I'm, I'm disappointed actually. I mean, like Google is, is very much behind the FIDO initiative, but they don't seem to have put much thought into it. They seem to have backed the wrong horse. And disturbingly, if something's backed by Google, Apple, and Facebook, I think the rest of the community more or less surrenders and says, okay, that's it, game over. We have to do it their way, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. So I, I don't think they've backed the right horse. I think, like Fido, basically they're leveraging the, 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 the public key cryptography of the 1970s, just nothing but more or less than good old fashioned RSA. That's 50 year old technology. I mean, we don't fly in 50 year old airplanes. You know, we, do, we don't fly in biplanes and turboprops anymore. I mean, we, it's, it's, a, it's a condemnation of, of the cryptography industry that people are still using the tools of the 70s and 80s. You know, we, we, cryptography and cryptographic research has come up with much better ideas in the meantime. I think we need, we need to push more aggressively for their adoption, you know, so uh, that because the, the, the world is becoming a very complicated place. The requirements for cryptography are becoming more, more complicated. You know, it's not just straightforward, encrypt everything. It's not the lump hammer of RSA anymore. We need more sophisticated tools. I think of pairing this cryptography as being like a Swiss pen knife. RSA is a big lump hammer. You know, we don't have to uh, encrypt everything. You know, we can have attribute based crypto. We can be more subtle in terms of what we do. And it's not just pairing based crypto. I mean, lattice stuff can do a lot of this stuff, this new novel stuff as well. And I think we need to be pushing these companies into, into using the more modern tools rather than using the 50-year-old tools. The end. Yes, I think uh, we are done with the questions. Uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for, for, for attending and for their attention. And if there are any questions, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm around and I'm available to answer them. If any clarifications, I'd be happy to provide them. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I think we can uh, end up here. Uh, it was very nice uh, to have you today, uh, Mike. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Very nice. Uh, I really like it. Um, and yeah, thanks uh, to the audience as well. Uh, and yeah, hopefully we will see you soon again in the next uh, talks. Thanks. Thank you, Santos. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everybody.